Assalamu alaikum. Uh, myself, I'm uh, Samih Lawand, the head of cardiology at the Dalla Hospital, Kingdom Saudi Arabia, Riyadh, uh, interventional cardiologist. Uh, I'd like first to start by thanking uh, the Saudi Heart Association for uh, uh, backing up uh, this uh, very important uh, uh, educational uh, experience, uh, including what we call PCI expert case, case based uh, learning, and our host, uh, AstraZeneca, and the audience. Uh, our presentations today will include three uh, presentations. I have with me two of the uh, expertise and well-known, renowned uh, names, including Dr. Uh, Asad uh, Ma'louf, who is the head of cardiology division and head of quality improvement department at St. George's Hospital University Medical Center, Beirut, Lebanon. I also have with me Dr. Hadi Abu Hantash, uh, Assistant Professor of Cardiology at the University of Jordan, Amman, Jordan. We divided our topics into three. I will uh, talk, uh, uh, the essence of my presentation will be about the uh, underestimation of the risks uh, related to acute coronary syndromes. Uh, particularly the non STEMI. Uh, Dr. Malouf will talk about the appropriateness of management of uh, non STEMIs. And uh, Dr. Uh, Abu Hantash will talk about guideline based interventions in STEMI cases. I will start with mine so that we do not uh, allow much of the time to go without it. Now, the, I, I chose this title, uh, Underestimation of the Ischemic Risk and Mortality Rates of non STEMI, because I thought it's a very important to underscore this uh, uh, title rather than giving it a more general. My agenda will be acute coronary syndrome, risk factors, and how serious it is. And the discussion will be including two cases uh, which will include, of course, the diagnosis, risk certification, and uh, management. As you know, the highest risk of cardiovascular events post MI occurs within the first year. But risk remains, however, continuous in a linear fashion and may extend up to five years, as the data has already shown. The patients who uh, have certain criteria, we call them older age, for example, increased risk of cardiovascular death of MI and over three years, and diabetics in particular. These are the patients that were included in the Pegasus uh, trial extended up to three years. And these particular patients have shown additional risks. What is the definition of acute coronary syndrome? And you know, it includes both unstable angina and acute coronary uh, events. We call it myocardial infarctions. The latter is subdivided into, uh, at least by electrocardiographic changes, into non-ST elevation and the ST elevation myocardial infarctions. As you know, the uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death globally. Half of the deaths are due to cardiovascular disease, which are attributable to acute coronary syndromes. And this data from the World Health, Health uh, Organization talked about out of 16 million deaths under the age of 70 due to non-communicable diseases, 37%, that means more than one third of them are caused by cardiovascular disease. Among those, uh, the patients with ACS, 61% had non STEMI uh, events, which is probably uh, considered a majority. The, 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 the facts about risk factors are, are plenty. You can tell from this slide how much of the age, uh, previous aspirin uh, intake, the dyslipidemia, diabetes, smoking, renal insufficiency, obesity, and, uh, and so on, and, uh, hypertension, and not to forget the prior revascularization. All of these have shown uh, associations uh, in terms of contribution to acute coronary syndromes. 
not to forget smoking. As you know, diabetes with or without smoking, hypertension with or without smoking, dyslipidemia, and you will notice that smoking is associated with a uh, uh, higher risk, particularly in the younger age, as you see it here. Now, this is just a pathological image that explains it all, tells you how the plaque has been built already, with, uh, Im imagining it more like a volcano where the inflammatory cells, the endothelial layer has been injured and all this had fitted in inside the vessel wall only to develop a, the, the so-called the explosion or the whether it's minimized or uh, localized or completely occluding the vessel depends on the cardiac event. And the common pathway that goes through it is basically dependent on a very important organ called the platelets. And the platelets is a factory of receptors. It takes anything from thrombins to thrombexines, to ADPs, to other proteins related to what you call uh, uh, antagonists of other uh, uh, aggregants, etc. And no doubt, not to forget the Wolf Parkinson, uh, these uh, uh, Will brands and the fibrinogen linkage and uh, ligands that are available. And beyond that, let's go directly to our data. Our data is so important when compared to the rest of the world. From this uh, so-called uh, Gulf uh, registry on acute coronary syndrome, the common, the accepted pattern, which is probably also present in other uh, second and third world countries is that ACS patients in the Gulf area are about 10 years younger than those in the developed world, whether it is compared to the USA, Denmark, or Australia. Let's go to the international community registries. We'll talk about the GRACE registry, and within the first six month prediction of the risks, you will see that in this registry, of course, 94, 94 hospitals of 14 countries, North uh, and South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand were included. Over 44,000 patients were included with acute coronary syndromes with or without uh, uh, ST elevation. And look at that first six month outcome. You will see that non STEMI predominated after the first two months the highest percentage of mortality compared to those with STEMI and compared to those with unstable angina but without. Uh, uh, myocardial injury. And if you look at the number of vessel diseased, you will see that triple vessel disease over a period of one year represented the highest mortality, almost 8%, which is double, almost double that much of that of the double vessel disease and one third uh, and three times higher than those of single vessel disease. This just predicts uh, a prediction of how complicated the, their outcomes could be based on the number of diseased vessels. There comes again the GRACE UK Belgian study, which talked about the longer term uh, risk. And uh, basically, this is a, a contribution from UK with 2000 that plus. Uh, and from Belgium and 1,600 plus patients, uh, individual follow-ups and record linkage to 99.8% of these patients at five years. Only four patients were missed, and you will see what happened at five years. As you notice that with STEMI, uh, the uh, uh, index of cardiovascular death reached around 6% early on uh, after the event, only to remain more or less the same at five years. But if you look at the non-STEMI, you will see these patients who presented the index of cardiovascular death around 2% tripled, uh, actually uh, multiplied by seven times uh, by the time it uh, reached uh, uh, five years, indicating that in spite of the impact of acute STEMI on the left ventricular function and arrhythmia and development of heart failure, it remains that non-STEMI represents the highest risk as time goes by. 
this is just a survival probability of those patients in the same registry indicative that after the initial separation, more or less the mortality uh, and survival associated with these, with the STEMI and non-STEMI are more or less uh, the same. But if you go by the, those who are considered high versus intermediate, Versus, uh, versus uh, low risk, you will see that uh, the survival probability of those patients at highest risk is the lowest uh, than com when compared to intermediate and those at low risk. And this is also at five years. The long-term mortality risk as it is uh, divided when associated or when, when risk certified by the presence of diabetes has been, long, by, has been studied by Al Abbas and his group. And you will see that uh, uh, the long-term excess mortality is definitely related. You will see here after initial assessment of over 930,000 patients, and after uh, what you call analytical cohort uh, merging and general population file reviews, etc., they ended up with 700 plus thousand patients. 40% of them were STEMI and course, 60% were non-STEMI. The majority of the patients uh, in the non-STEMI group were actually uh, diabetics. And look at the uh, outcome. Over, uh, on the uh, left-hand side, you will see the outcome uh, uh, within the first month after the uh, acute event. You will see that in patients with uh, acute STEMI, 72% higher risk of excess mortality. And in patients with non-STEMI, you will see that 67% higher risk of excess mortality when it comes to non-STEMI. And if you look at uh, extended follow-up years, you will see up to eight years, the same pattern continues and the same separation uh, do not abate and continue to reflect the same pattern. And when we removed the STEMI from the same uh, uh, data, you will notice that diabetics versus non-diabetics, this is non-diabetic, survival probability at uh, 30 days, diabetic at 30 days, and again, over the eight years to follow, the same data has shown continued separation of outcome uh, related to uh, survival in these patients. At this level, I will start with my first case, a 73-year-old male diabetic hypertensive with a previous history of having had PCI to the left circumflex three years before uh, while the diseased LAD at that time was left for medical therapy considered as diffusely diseased. And the, however, over the time, ejection fraction deteriorated and since then became a patient of heart failure. When he came to us, he presented with shortness of breath and chest pain. His troponin I was positive and his diagnosis upon presentation was non-STEMI with associated two to one heart block. His cath revealed, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, go through uh, brick, uh, briskly, moderate to heavily calcified, 80 up to 95% diffuse disease of the LAD, uh, dominant uh, left circumflex, widely patent previous uh, proximal to mid stents, but with moderate, perhaps severe, but distal disease, and but uh, LPDA actually could not be seen well uh, to correct the statement. The vessel of the RCA was uh, diffusely diseased but non-dominant. So the diagnosis was severe calcified diffusely diseased LAD and patent stents. Now the question is what were the recommendations? So I decided at that time that I will do the LAD and of course a temporary pace wire. And this is the anatomy. You will see the LAD, the fewness. You see calcium heavy in the proximal, and then the rest of the vessel diffusely diseased all the way to the apex. And if you look at the circumflex where the stents are here, are okay. But if you go more deeply distally, you will see some disease not very clearly seen. And here again, the LAD, diffuse disease, and here the circumflex, which is a dominant vessel. And you'll see there is now 
but you can tell subtotal or diffusely diseased, uh, uh, not knowing exactly how, uh, how big is the vessel distally, but certainly diffusely diseased. And if you look at the right coronary artery, you can see on the right that it is severely diseased, but um, dominant. My strategy was to start ballooning, uh, wiring the LAD ballooned, and uh, and you notice on the on my right side, you see that the uh, balloon could not open uh, at high pressure. I had to change it to a cutting balloon, and so that I could uh, manage uh, to uh, uh, open it. And eventually, I managed to open it, and then uh, continued to show the improvement, and then continued my ballooning to the mid uh, segments, etc., proximal, and then I decided to put a stent. I usually avoid putting a stent in the distality, uh, although the distality was diffused the disease. And here I put my first stent, and then I put my second stent. These are long stents, and you can see that uh, except for the this very distal runoff that remained uh, and well here i uh, i'm on the right side you can see i'm ballooning look at the at the shape of the balloon it has a little bulb at the at distal edge it scared me when i saw it but i could tell you what happened exactly you can tell this is what happened you see a little ballooning of the vessel at, uh, at the distal edge indicative that if i continued dilating i could have ruptured that vessel uh, of course, at that level, uh, I continued distally with a drug eluting balloon. And this was the final result. This was in February 2019, LAD with good runoff. The branches are all there. The circ, we did not touch it. However, in May of 2019, of course, the patient I followed in my clinic, but late before May, it started to develop symptoms, uh, only to come with uh, uh, accelerated uh, symptoms. And then uh, at that time, we suspected uh, ischemia, and it was proven, uh, <clears throat> but this time without new ECG changes. Troponin actually elevated and considered as a non-STEMI. The cath, I will not go through details. I will show it to you, but at the end, the LAD appeared beautifully patent, and the question is what happened to the left circumflex. And you will see here that the LAD is actually reasonably well patent, now five months, uh, actually uh, four months after, and you will see the LAD is no more, more rugged. The area here that was better now appearing uh, much worse. The runoff is barely showing, so there should have been a progression of the disease. The RCA remained the same, unchanged. And then I decided, okay, this is my plan. I will treat the CERC. And I started by managing to enter this subtotally, diffusely unseen uh, distal runoff, including LPDA and uh, LPL branches. And I started this series of dilatations, uh, uh, including the smallest balloon, on this left is 1.2, and then uh, bigger, and then I decided to uh, treat the, the very distal area with a drug eluting uh, balloon, and then I decided to treat this is the drug eluting balloon result, and then I decided to treat a more proximal lesion also with another stent, and they, with that, and they post dilated, and this is the final result. I feel I believe we made this distal runoff much better than before while keeping the LAD in good shape. This is my first case, we'll, we can ask questions later. This is my second case, and I will in, uh, intend to show you how multivessel disease can also be a problem in these patients. This is a 51-year-old who presented to our hospital, actually to my clinic to, for the first time. He was seen long uh, years before. And the symptoms were one hour of chest pain associated shortness of breath. I admitted him. His blood pressure was reasonable, uh, and he had dyslipidemia. In 2009, he actually developed, had a cabbage for supposedly triple vessel uh, disease. Uh, then uh, a year later, he had a PCI uh, to SBG LCX, 
that actually, not a year, actually about five years later, uh, and that was uh, uh, treated twice. Each time it re reblocks itself, and eventually the third time uh, in another institution, it became totally occluded, and he was managed as a uh, chronic ischemic state. Uh, my diagnosis was non STEMI with multivessel disease, and we did all the investigations. It shows the uh, old inferior uh, MI ejection fraction was reasonable, moderate mitral regurgitation, no congestion. This is his work. Troponin was high, and uh, uh, triglycerides were high, uh, and we uh, cholesterol was acceptable, 3.5. Now, this is the anatomy. I will show you what they are, and then I'll show you the plan to treat. And this is his anatomy. Uh, we'll... I don't know why it's run, not running. Okay, sorry. This is, uh, this is not the LED. This is mostly a diagonal and the septal perforators. In the middle, there should be an LED, okay? So this is a stent previously done here, and also the septal perforators. And you cannot see much of the left circumflex. This is, again, the diagonals, the septals, no LAD, and this is the circ, what's left of it. Totally occluded circ. That's the lima, the only patent graft. The distal LAD is diseased, but the, the anastomosis is perfect, and perhaps not much to be done there. And again, this is the Lima and other view. That's the right coronary artery. And this is the aortic gram that finds where are the grafts. You can see the grafts are all occluded. Now, the question is what to do. I suggested to the patient that I will do CTO to his left circumflex and perhaps to his right, and I quoted him 60 to 70% success rate. He was scary of the decision and decided to go home. I sent him home on this medical therapy, which included all possibilities. Now, only to come back in September. So this is, uh, I think, in uh, May, only to come back in September. Uh, August, sorry, August, and then in one month, he came back now with chest pain worsening, shortness of breath several hours, and uh, uh, seen in the ER with ST depression. Ejection fracture is still reasonable, etc. moderate MR, and troponin was really high. I decided then to do a PCI based on the anatomy to the CTO LCX. This is my uh, 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 vascularization plan. These are the wires I used, Gaia 2, Conquest Pro, and CyanoBlue 2 OM. And these are the equipments I used. And let's see what happened. This is my wire. It went astray initially, uh, not exactly getting into the lumen, corrected. And again, I'm not seeing much. And all of a sudden, I managed to go. Where did I go? Initially, I wasn't sure because nothing is showing. I kept it in place. I started to maneuver. This is, uh, I call it a bougie effect. I just push my uh, so-called microcatheter or my balloon, very smallest balloon, and I just push in and out repeatedly in order to see some flow. And Again, uh, perhaps in the middle, there is some little flow. At least with this maneuver, I did not perforate. It means probably I'm in lumen or probably subintimal. And I kept uh, by using my small balloon and I'm seeing more, my small balloon, and I'm seeing more, again, more distally. And again, ballooning, bigger balloons, bigger balloons. And now I decided to stand the proximal segment. I used a long stand. And this is after stenting. Now the distal runoff, I am in lumen, but it's not a very good distal runoff. So I decided to improve the first, first stand, which I did. And then I decided to put another stand because I did not think a drug eluting balloon, although distal, 
could serve the purpose and I put it and then I, uh, sorry, this is the final result. I put the stent and I decided, and this was my final result. This is the circ with the OM. There is a part of it that you don't see and I will probably never be able to see because it was a branch going to the AV groove. It's totally occluded. But with this view, now uh, you can tell that there is a decent vessel. This is the treatment at discharge, included uh, uh, aspirin, berlenta, concor, isobide, and cover seal, etc., and crystal high dose. Readmitted again in October, and again treated as ACS uh, with a, a slight elevation in troponin, not, nothing significant, but at least it was an ACS. And this time, ejection fraction 45% worsening MR, and now I have to decide what to do. And after reviewing the anatomy, I decided to do PCI, CT, or RTA. And this is the uh, mechanism that I used, the guiders, the Gaia 3 now, much uh, more uh, powerful, Pilots 50 and Cyan Blue, and microcatheters, and wires, and pre-dilatations all the way from the smallest to the biggest, and stenting, everywhere. I will show you the images. Now, this is the anatomy, beautiful, and uh, for the circ and the uh, uh, LAD uh, territory. And this is what's left of the right. And I decided, okay, let me try. And this is my policy, escalating balloons. This is my wire. Of course, this wire is a Gaia 3. And I started searching for my root. You can tell. Then I supported it with my microcatheter. I made a penetration and I kept advancing, hoping I am in lumen. This branch gave me hope because I saw the branch at the distal tip of the wire. And then you will see that I managed with a branching point, which means I'm probably in, but look at the distality. You will see that I am in either in a branch which probably will more likely, but I'm missing the bigger branch. Look how small the anatomy is. And I decided to start, uh, this is the support of the microcatheter injection. I felt better because when I injected the microcatheter, I found myself inside the lumen, which gave me reassurance that I'm doing the right thing and then continued and continued. But now, okay, sorry, this is a repetition. And I'm looking for an the presence of flow, limited flow. So I, I did the same technique. I put a bougie in and out repeatedly to see if I can improve the flow. Ah, oh, yes, there is some flow there. So it means I can work safely without uh, puncturing the vessel. And I started using ballonings, ballonings, very small balloons, improving flow. And again, and now I realize that I have another branch I didn't deal with. You will see it here, and this is a big branch. So I had to, after the improving flow, to change my policy and add another wire into that branch. And I managed to cross into it. And then I started with bigger balloons. And here we are showing some improvement. I decided to put a stent. And I started more distally before the bifurcation, immediately before, and then put another stent more proximally and post dilated. And you'll see post dilatations. Now I have a decent flow distal, approximately, but not much decent distally. So I had to uh, manage uh, the more distal part of the vessel and again escalating with the balloons. And this is the final result. I felt I, I have helped him. And uh, this is his discharge medications. Typical uh, of his uh, condition, Preventa, Aspirin, Crestor, Cover Seal 10 to improve his uh, LV function. Uh, and I seen him one week later doing well, no chest pain. Then I saw him again in two months doing well, no chest pain. Did well for several months. But you cannot guarantee everything. Only to receive a phone call 
from his wife eight months later that the patient died suddenly while in bed without prior symptoms. I here will stop and we'll see, uh, I think uh, if we have time, we can uh, respond to questions, but I prefer if uh, you all agree that we can go to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Uh, uh, Asad Malouf, to talk about uh, the, the appropriateness of managing patients with acute coronary syndrome, Dr. Asad. Okay, well, hello everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, great. Well, uh, I will be discussing uh, a couple of uh, interesting cases uh, and uh, the discussion will be uh, targeted towards redefining antiplatelet treatment, the standard of care in acute coronary syndrome. Well, uh, as uh, Samih mentioned, the heart disease and stroke uh, statistics uh, are uh, decreasing over the past uh, few years, but the non-ST elevation MI represents 75% of the acute coronary syndrome, while ST elevation MI represents 25% now. And these are the statistics that uh, are from the states reflecting the statistics that Dr. Lawand mentioned that in the beginning, uh, the uh, ST elevation MI is, has a higher risk of mortality, while uh, if you follow these patients over uh, eight years period, you would see that uh, the mortality with the non-ST elevation MI uh, is higher than that with the, S with the ST elevation MI. And if you look uh, to the right side uh, with the uh, PCI intervention, uh, there is a significant improvement in the mortality of patients uh, who come in with non-ST elevation MI, and therefore uh, the PCI is globally now uh, no uh, treatment for uh, non-ST elevation MI. Now, what are the challenges in antiplatelet management uh, in patients undergoing PCI for acute coronary syndrome? Well, there are several sources of uh, thrombotic risks after uh, coronary uh, stenting, uh, such as uh, prothrombotic conditions related to the uh, underlying patient characteristics, activation of local thrombotic risk by stent and PCI results, and chronic atherosclerotic disease uh, manifestation uh, remote from the procedure. Now, the introduction of the P2Y12 uh, receptor inhibitors, in addition to aspirin, has led to a substantial reduction in post-PCI thrombotic events, but this is definitely at the expense of bleeding events, and both are associated with fatal events. Now, in the coming uh, uh, two cases discussion, I aim to provide a review of antithrombotic therapy after PCI in patients with uh, acute coronary artery disease, mainly discussing the duration as well as the combination of ADAPT. Well, the first case was a complication. And uh, in this patient, uh, she was a woman, uh, 53 year old, uh, admitted uh, to the hospital with uh, chest pain of 30 minutes duration. Now the pain resolved uh, in the emergency room. She is, uh, has familial uh, dyslipidemia and she's hypertensive. Her home medications were just Lipitor and Tritase. <clears throat> and her vital signs on admission were stable. Her troponin was uh, slightly elevated. Her EKG shows uh, ST, uh, ST wave inversion, ST depression ST wave inversion. And the echo shows uh, mild uh, anterior wall uh, hypokinesis. Now the emergency room physician gave this patient aspirin, clopidogrel, IV nitrates, and they gave, he gave her also subcutaneous Lovenox. Now, would you change clopidogrel to a more potent uh, P2Y12 inhibitor? This was the uh, first question I raised. And then, uh, of course, uh, from the 2020 ESC guidelines, 
you can see that uh, uh, that uh, the more inhibitor uh, P2Y12 inhibitors, they are more effective in these uh, patients, and you have ticagrelor irrespective of the planned treatment strategy. You can give ticagrelor or even prasugrel if you have it on board, especially if you're going for uh, PCI. Now. The, uh, the efficacy of ticagrelor has, uh, has been well known from the PLATO trial uh, and followed for one year uh, with the composite uh, of uh, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. You have a significant reduction compared to clopidogrel. And uh, the same is for myocardial uh, infarction. There is a significant uh, reduction in uh, myocardial infarction. As far as stent thrombosis, also it was extremely efficient compared to uh, clopidogrel. Now, switching between oral uh, P2Y12 inhibitors is uh, well known. You, you, you uh, load the patient with the 180 milligram ticagrelor and you continue the maintenance dose, but you have to load these patients. Now, the diagnostic and geography uh, showed a severe circumflex uh, lesion, as you can see it here. Uh, mild calcification, uh, nothing uh, major. There is also significant LAD lesion, good distal runoff, good distal runoff. Uh, the diagonal branches uh, are acceptable. There is moderate severe disease on the branches, but they're not too big. Now the right coronary artery, uh, there is a lesion uh, in the ostium here, which looks uh, moderate, hazy, but there is a significant lesion in this part, in this portion here. Now, how would you approach this patient? Would you, would you bypass this patient or would you just do PCI? What is the evidence uh, behind it? Well, the recommendation uh, from 2020 ASC guideline tells you that you have to follow the syntax score. And this is classification 1B. So looking into this, the uh, syntax score in this patient calculated was about 20. 20, meaning by this, this is a low tertiary, and you can definitely go either way. You can send the patient for cabbage or you can do PCI. And obviously I went with PCI uh, knowing that the patient is a young patient and the success rate is gonna be a high success rate. Now, the second question that comes to your mind is which lesion would you stand? Would you stand the circumflex? Would you stand the LAD? Would you stand the RCA? Would you stand them all? What would you stand? Well, the evidence also here tells you that complete revascularization should be considered in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome patients without cardiogenic shock and with multivessel disease. And this shows you that with time, if you don't stand the non-culprit lesion, then there is a high risk of recurrent MI in the non-culprit lesion. Now, I elected to go with the uh, PCI procedure for the three vessels, multi vessels. And I started with the uh, LAD. I uh, put a wire in the backup wire in the diagonal. Uh, simple, straightforward, uh, not much calcification. I went primary stenting. Uh, had to go up with the pressure uh, quite a bit, but the result uh, looked uh, beautiful in the LAD. Uh, you see the circumflex lesion here is quite significant, but the LAD was probably the culprit lesion uh, looking at the echocardiography. So uh, this is why I started with that. Now the, the, the circumflex uh, lesion was the same, exactly the same, uh, very simple, very straightforward. And the result was uh, quite acceptable. Now, I went to the uh, right coronary artery and then I wired the right coronary artery and suddenly 
the vessel dissected. And the patient started to have severe chest pain, bradycardia. So uh, she was nearly uh, arrest. So I decided to stand the proximal part to preserve uh, the flow and then The flow went beautifully well. The heart rate recovered after atropine and the inflating here, and there was a significant lesion distally, so I elected to stent it. And luckily, the result uh, was beautiful. Uh, so the incidence of catheter-induced coronary artery dissection during percutaneous coronary intervention ranged between 2.2% to 0.4%. Mind you that this could be also uh, due to the wire uh, dissection. Now, what are the predictors of the uh, uh, catheter-induced uh, dissections? As you can see, female gender, female gender, uh, complex lesions, proximal lesions, and she had three of these. Uh, of course, uh, chronic kidney disease is one of them. And then, but, but she had three of the four uh, predictors of uh, the catheter-induced uh, dissection. Now, this patient uh, was somewhat related to me and uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh, uh, get the best out of the procedure. So kind of... Uh, emotionally involved with the patient, but uh, the post-procedure complication looking into the uh, complication of catheter-induced uh, dissection is not, uh, is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, it, it increases the in-hospital all-cause death. It increases in-hospital adverse cardiovascular events as far as cardiogenic shock, heart failure, increases definitely cabbage and post-procedure uh, MI. Now the management, the management, if you have a type A or B dissection, you can manage it uh, just conservatively, conservatively, or you can put a stent if you want to, this is not a big deal, but the big deal comes here. If you have a type C, D, E, or F dissection, then you have to be aggressive in, in managing this patient invasively as the, there is a high, much higher incidence of acute complications with these patients. Uh, you should use soft uh, tip wire. Definitely do not inject contrast in the guiding catheter. If you want to know where you, where you are, uh, you can inject a very small amount of contrast in over the wire balloon, but definitely don't inject any contrast in the guiding catheter because you can increase the dissection and make it much worse. Now, the second case was an urgent and a quite rare case. Uh, but an interesting case. Uh, this patient is a 69-year-old man uh, admitted to the emergency room uh, with 30 minutes chest pain and dyspnea. The patient had, interestingly, five days history of progressive dyspnea on, on exertion. And uh, on admission to the ER, uh, the patient had been known to have diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and he was a heavy smoker. Um, post PCI, uh, he had three stents five years uh, prior to admissions. His medications, as you can see, are glucophage, aspicot, crestor, diovan, concord, and dusopress. His physical exam on admission, unremarkable. He was uh, healthy looking, he was fine, uh, asymptomatic at the time, breathing normally. Uh, blood tests uh, were unremarkable except for a mildly increased troponin. Chest X-ray had clear lungs with mild cardiomegaly, nothing much. And the EKG showed some uh, ST depression and T-wave inversion uh, laterally. His echocardiography showed some uh, inferior wall hypokinesis with moderate diastolic dysfunction, but normal systolic function. He was loaded with aspirin, brinta, and lovenox, and he was uh, sent to the cath lab. Uh, well, uh, just to tell you that the Brilinta was, is a safe uh, medication looking at the uh, uh, difference between Ticagrelor and Clopidogrel, uh, and as far as major bleeding uh, are concerned, 
So I was not concerned about uh, this issue. And I took the patient to the cath lab, but in the cath lab, the patient experienced acute episode of severe dyspnea and orthopnea. His oxygen saturation deteriorated rapidly, requiring high oxygen flow, and he was on the edge of intubation. Physical exam showed severe respiratory distress, orthopnea, an oxygen saturation on 87% on 10 liter oxygen. His vital blood pressure was okay. He was definitely tachycardic, tachypneic, and he had lung crackers all over with elevated JVDs and an apical holosystolic murmur. We gave him IV, IV push Lasix immediately and morphine. And the question was, how early would you intervene? Would you stabilize the patient? Would you uh, intervene rapidly? Uh, the patient is on the verge of intubation. What would you do? We didn't have time to do an echo because we didn't transport the echo from the echo lab. There was no time. The decision has to be taken immediately. And the decision, obviously, was to go invasively, uh, rapidly. And the reason for that, this was uh, that was as a mechanical complication of myocardial uh, infarction. Uh, and the patient had heart failure clearly related to non-ST uh, elevation acute coronary syndrome. So he had two major indications to intervene on this spot. We calculated the GRACE uh, ACS risk uh, model score and it was very high, proving that we have to intervene rapid. Now the diagnostic angiography, what did it show? It showed moderate lesion in the circumflex. There is, uh, looks like a severe uh, lesion in the proximal LAD. Yes, it was a significant lesion in the proximal LAD. But the problem was here. And mind you that the patient was very unstable on the verge of uh, uh, being intubated. So he had a severe lesion here and there. So the PCI procedure immediately, I had to give some flow to the distal RCA to relieve the patient from the severe mitral regurgitation and the pulmonary edema. So I stented the proximal RCA <clears throat> and then the distal RCA so that there's some disease here. So I sent it this one too. And the result was very good. Some uh, recoil here, but it was uh, quite acceptable. And the patient started to recover slowly, but rapidly. Uh, he, he, uh, he improved tremendously within a few minutes. I don't know if it was only the Lasix or the Lasix and the dilatation, but he improved quite a bit and he did not require as much as oxygen on the cath lab table. Well, ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation is a complication of uh, myocardial infarction and uh, the the important finding here is that the right coronary artery is the sole uh, blood supply for the posterior medial papillary muscle, which puts this uh, papillary muscle at risk for severe mitral regurgitation. However, there, was a, there is a dual uh, blood supply from the LAD and diagonal to the lateral uh, papillary muscle, which is uh, less vulnerable uh, than the uh, medial papillary muscle. Now the patient did well and considering his case that it, if this happened at home, uh, he, would have, he would have died. I mean, there was no question about it. So he's quite a high risk uh, patient for ischemic disease. What is your discharge oral antiplatelet strategy in this case? Well, let's look at the, uh, at the uh, information here. The dual antiplatelet uh, duration uh, strategy is really a balance uh, between ischemic risk and bleeding risk. And there is some overlap between these two. Uh, as you can see here, the uh, ischemic risk, uh, diabetes, acute coronary syndrome, prior MI, low EF, CKD, complex PCI lesions. I will show you what are the complex PCI lesions. Definitely stent diameter, the smaller the diameter, the worse. 
the priory vascularization and multivessel disease. If you look at the bleeding risk, you have age, low or high BMI, triple therapy, if you have oral anticoagulant, CKD, that you can see here also, anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, liver disease, major bleed on that, chronic steroid, non-steroid anti-inflammatory use. And there are some bleeding scores that you can use in this situation, which are the precise DAP, the ARC HBR, and the DAP. These are the most commonly used now scoring system. Now the thrombotic risk in this category of patient, weighing the balance between thrombotic risk and bleeding risk, high thrombotic risk are these categories. Risk enhancers, they are diabetic patients. These are high risk, history of MI, any multivessel, CK is coronary artery disease, polyvascular disease, coronary artery disease, plus peripheral artery disease, premature or accelerated coronary artery disease, concomitant systematic, uh, systemic inflammatory disease, CKD. And uh, maybe here we can add also the COVID-19 on top of that. Now the technical aspect, the complex uh, PCI cases that uh, are important, at least three stents implanted. And you need to have only one criteria from these. So at least three stents implanted, at least three lesions uh, treated, total stent length of 60 millimeter, history of complex revascularization, left main, or especially bifurcation. Bifurcation stenting in the technical aspect is considered one of the highest uh, risk of thrombotic uh, events and definitely history of stent thrombosis on antiplatelet treatment. Now the non-complex uh, coronary artery disease or considered moderate thrombotic, at least one criteria, diabetes, history of recurrent MI, polyvascular disease, and, and CKD. Now, where, where do we stand in this category of patient? Uh, you calculate the precise depth. The precise depth score in the beginning will tell you if you need to treat the patient for 12 months or earlier. Once you reach there, you calculate the DAPT score. If it is more than two, you continue for 36 months or you stop at 12. Now, how do we proceed with this? Well, <clears throat> there is a period here, which is a very vulnerable period as far as ischemic disease, not only towards the end, but especially in the beginning. You have the patient has to be very much protected, especially for the two patients I presented to you. These are high-risk patients for thrombosis, and they have to be extremely well uh, protected, these patients. So in this uh, period, the 12 months is an extremely important period, but especially in the first few months. And then later, from 12 months to 36 uh, months, then it is, is also important, but not as important as the beginning. Now the precise DAPT score uh, calculated gave us 19, which is moderate risk that would tell us that we can uh, treat the patient for one year, moderate risk for bleeding, then we can treat the patient for one year because the balance is more towards better protection for ischemia uh, rather than a bleeding risk. And therefore we had to give the patient the best uh, dual antiplatelet treatment for one year to protect the patient from ischemic events. Now, once at one year, would you continue for 36 months or not? If you calculate the DAPT score, uh, 36 months is the case in this patient because you exceeded the number two uh, with reaching five because the patient is diabetic, had prior MI, hypertension, smoking, history of heart failure, my presentation had so many risk factors for thrombosis. So you have to continue with this patient for 36 months uh, with dual antiplates. And this is the recommendation from the uh, uh, 2020 also uh, ESC guidelines uh, for uh, maintenance uh, treatment in the patients. The standard is the 12 months dual antiplatelet. But prolonging the standard for 36 months, 30, 36 months, 
okay, is considered an indication if the patient has a high risk of ischemic events and without increased risk of major, you have to under major or life-threatening bleeding. So if he had moderate life-threatening bleeding with high risk of ischemic events, you definitely give this patient uh, a dual antiplatelet for a very long period. Okay. Also, you add this prevention may be considered patient with moderately increased, not high risk, but moderately increased, also with no high risk bleeding consequences, major or life threatening. And then you have the acute coronary syndrome with no prior stroke or transient MI. Then you can give uh, these patients low dose river of river roxaban and, uh, for a long period of time. So you have three uh, strategies that you can follow. Two of them with the dual antiplatelet, one with the river roxaban. Each one of them has a number to treat to give you a, a better effect. Now, in this patient, reaching 36 months is, is the target. But what if your patient had a high bleeding score? What would happen in this case? In this case, you will look at the first 12 months. And what is the strategy? in this case, where the recommendation for post-intervention and maintenance treatment from the SC2020 tells you that if you have the precise depth score, which is high, more than 25, our patient was 19, but if it goes higher than 25, or if you use the ARC, HBR criteria uh, for a high risk of bleeding, then you can discontinue P2Y12 receptors inhibitor therapy after three months. Okay. So the period of three months to six months is a critical period. But if you have a high breathing risk score, you can stop earlier. Okay. And you can use also de-escalation in case you need to. Now, this is the uh, graph that shows you how this is managed. Looking at this, this is the bleeding risk. You have low bleeding risk, high bleeding risk, and very high bleeding risk. And down you have the arrow that shows you the ischemic risk going into the uh, left. So the higher ischemic risk to the left and very high bleeding risk to the right. Now, looking into this, if you have someone minutes, with, low, uh, with a low uh, ischemic risk, then you can use all this strategy with uh, dual antiplatelet for longer period of time, as you can see, and as I mentioned before. But if you go with a high or very high bleed, then the strategy is very delicate and you have to be very careful there. You can use one of the... Uh, Looking into this, you can use the triple therapy here or the uh, uh, DAPT guidelines here or anticoagulant. This is the DAPT guidelines. But the new strategies, looking into this one. But this is for very high bleeding risk. Now, <clears throat> comes into effect here. These are the studies that based on these, the, uh, the, uh, the smart choice, smart date, of course, the Cure Triton T38 and the Plato were the, were the standards of the 12 months. And looking into 36 months was the DAPT and Pegasus T54. These are the major studies, plus the meta-analysis that, that looked into these also. But what is interesting is the very short period. What happens in these cases? Well, the Xions 28, which was uh, recently uh, published at the TCT, shows that looking into one month's uh, treatment with DAPT in a combination of patients with acute coronary syndrome and non-acute coronary syndrome patients, in stable patients, okay, shows that it may be safe during this period. Okay. But mind you, the period that is between three months and 12 months has been shown in some studies in high-risk ischemic patients, that if you stop your DAPT earlier than necessary, you will have a higher risk of MI. 
myocardial infarction. So you have to be very careful when to stop the dual antiplatelet treatment before 12 months. But the studies now that are looking into this are looking also not as an early management only, but also with the new generation DES and with the adjunctive use of the IVIS and OCT because it has been shown that if you have an excellent result using IVIS or OCT in patients with acute coronary syndrome using dual antiplatelet treatment, you can stop your dual antiplatelet treatment earlier than the duration that is standard, especially in these patients who are high or extremely very high risk. And therefore, the importance in the future is the patient selection. The patient selection is the most important thing you can deal with in looking into which patient will be treated with which medication and for how long without putting the patient at risk for either thrombosis or bleeding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Asad. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, Dr. Abu Hantash will now talk about uh, his STEMI cases and uh, the guidelines uh, uh, for the management. Okay, Dr. Hadi. So I'm mute myself, okay? Uh, Samir, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Samir. Uh, thanks to the uh, Saudi Heart Association for <laughs> this wonderful and kind invitation. Thanks for AstraZeneca for sure for organizing the meeting. And thanks for our colleagues who are watching us actually a bit late. Uh, we and our men are under lockdown. So uh, I hope that uh, what we're doing will be fruitful to everybody. Now, my, my job actually is going to be a bit easier than what uh, Samir uh, and Dr. Malouf did. Uh, I will try to make it simpler of a message. I will focus on Tigagiril and semi patients. And I chose two cases which actually point to the weakness of using clopidogrel, not only in the acute phase of STEMI, actually it, more or less in patients who are treated for coronary artery disease with the clopidogrel. Let me, let me show you this. The first patient is a 63-year-old male He's a colleague radiologist. Unfortunately, he, he is a heavy smoker, overweight, with type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemic, and hypertensive. He had previous myocardial infarction in the past, and he received an LAD DES at that time. The, the, the morning of my uh, encounter with him, at 5 in the morning, he woke up with severe substantial chest pain. And he came into the emergency room just very early in the morning with ST elevation inferolaterally on his surface EKG. His medications included an ARB, a statin, oral hypoglycemic agent, a beta blocker, and DAPT, namely aspirin and clopidogrel. So what did I do? Uh, I loaded him with Ticagrel immediately, gave him 200 milligram of aspirin, he received 5,000 international units of unvaccinated heparin, and I took him to the cath lab. This is a radial approach cath. Uh, my way of doing my STEMIs in the past almost 10 years that I use radial almost ex exclusively. Uh, I like the EK 3.5 uh, from Churumo, which I can manipulate in at least eight to nine out of 10 STEMI patients to uh, uh, cannulate both the left and the right system. So this is the ACARI in the left system. And you can see here in the spider view that the stent in the LED is patent. There is some disease here on the 
PA colon in the proximal LAD, but it doesn't show here. So it's probably a bit eccentric, but it was not worrying me at the time. It was very obvious that his culprit here is this big cirque with a one, one, one Medina type of uh, disease. And you look at the continuation of the cirque here, it also has some moderate disease, but it's not that severe. So what did I do? Uh, I kept his ACT above 300. He was loaded with the Berlinta, as I said. I did not give him G2B3As at the time. Uh, uh, put two wires, one in the OM, one in the main cirque. I decided to balloon the main vessel first to make sure that I have a safe flow there. And then I went to the, without with leaving the balloon in the main vessel, I went to the OM, ballooned it, stented the uh, OM with very minimal protrusion, but mind you see that my balloon in the main vessel is still there. So I wanna make sure that I maintain the access to my circumflex. So I inflated the stent in the, in the obtuse marginal, pulled the balloon back a little bit and, and, and flared it up. Uh, and again, I just wanted to, to point out that my protrusion was very minimal in the main cirque. And with that in mind, I did balloon inflation simultaneously for both vessels to assure that can, I can access my uh, circumflex anti-gradely to stent it afterwards. So this is how the vessel looked like with the balloon angioplasty of the main vessel, stenting the uh, side vessel. And what did I do then? I put the stent in the main vessel. I decided at the time just to fix that moderate distal disease. And I put another stent to proximal, uh, and that's in the, in, in, in the main circ, covering that obtuse marginal. And we crossed the wire after deploying the stent, put two balloons, and did my simultaneous final kissing inflation uh, in, in both vessels. Simultaneous kissing. At that time, I did not do a part, uh, but I thought the simultaneous kissing might have done the job for me. And that's what I got at the end of the procedure. The patient was very stable. Uh, he was discharged within 36 hours out of the hospital. This was done several years ago. The patient is very stable again with no recurrences of any acute events. Why did I show this? It's not that of uh, a very complicated uh, bifurcating case, but uh, even when you encounter bifurcation semi at five, six in the morning. I think you have to go by the book and make sure you do a good job for those patients. If you're looking for long-term, not only acute term, good results. And the other thing, why I showed it, because remember the patient was on dual antiplatelet with aspirin and clopidogrel. And in spite of that, this dual antiplatelet failed them. And he got this thrombotic lesion, which was very high risk lesion, which could have led to him losing his life actually. So I, in my opinion, this is, a, this is more or less, other than his lifestyle, which is bad, it's also a failure of a clopidor in preventing the event. Um, this is a patient, actually, uh, which also can remind us of the unfortunate patient with uh, Samih dead, which the, who died suddenly in bed. This is a 67-year-old male dentist. He has type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemic. And he is 58 kilogram body weight. So I put this, I'm sure you know why, because if you're thinking about the Pasugo, uh, it's not a bad idea after all, but it's st it's still he is under 60 kilograms. He had a previous LAD, CERC, RCA, and posterior lateral of the RCA, PCIs, over the past several years with multiple DSs. He presented within the first hour of an acute onset of substantial chest pain and he had inferior ST elevation myocardial infarction. Again, this is another patient who was taking guideline therapy with beta blockers, statin, oral hypoglycemic agent, and DAPT. And what was the DAPT? 
aspirin and clopidogrel. I switched immediately to Gagular 180, gave him 200 milligram aspirin and 5,000 unfractionated heparin. I knew to Dr. Ma'louf, and we'll talk, we can talk about that in the discussion, that they use Lovinox subcutaneously, and that it will be interesting to know how, how Dr. Ma'louf manages ACT in the cat lab in those patients. We, that's a point for discussion, I'm sure. So this is the EKG of my patient. Obviously, ST elevation in the inferior leads, high uh, voltage R wave here in V1 and V2 with ST depression that he might have a posterior myocardial infarction at the time too, but I did not have posterior leads to, to prove it with ST depression in the lateral leads. So I took him immediately to the cat lab. Again, this is an AKA 3.5 uh, guide, six French, which is the inner diameter of which is 0.071. So it can accommodate a lot of things which we can do in the cat lab. This is a diabetic patient, believe it or not. I mean, look at those multiple stents. He, he has a good stent milieu in a way. He can receive stents without getting uh, ISRs as much as the other diabetic patients get. Multiple stents in the LED look beautiful, and the stents in the circumflex also look very good. So I went to the right corner okay, with uh, uh, radial approach again. And you can see that this is the culprit. And if you focus, it's in the middle of the stand. But let me show you this. The patient at that time, his ST elevation was coming down after my first injection. And I just wanted to show you something here. Let me go just to this here. One second, allow me, because I know where it is. Here we go. So let me just magnify this. So remember that this is inside the stem. So you can tell that most likely there's a clot there. I mean, probably this vessel was occluded totally in the emergency room with the, with the gagulol. I don't know if it worked that fast with unfractured heparin and me injecting in the right coronary, it opened the vessel. So in my opinion, this is an old stand which was implanted several years ago. Now, if you want to go by the book, even, even in ST elevation myocardial infarction, the patient is stabilizing on the cat table. The question is, what is the mechanism of this? To my eye, this is a, an old stand several years ago. He probably developed neoatherosclerosis. And most likely this neoatherosclerosis behaved like any other native atherosclerosis with the ruptured plaque, with the clot there, and it caused the uh, acute myocardial infarction. You also can postulate that this is a very late, beyond one year, stent thrombosis while he was taking aspirin and clopidogrel. And what did, what did I do? And I'm sure you all agree that's a very simple approach type of PCI. There's a PDA stent here, by the way, so my wire is in the posterior lateral. Just with simple ballooning, you could tell that this vessel opened. I didn't have IBUS in the cat lab, and you look at the stent boost here, you could appreciate that actually the stent implanted in the past was not really that under-expanded. So without the IBUS, I was trying to postulate what I do. I mean, if this was a simple smooth muscle cell proliferation, the, the, the vessel in that particular area will look like shaggy, like uh, irregular. So that's why I felt very comfortable after the simple balloon, just to put another stint within the stand. And I got results with Timmy 3 flow with excellent myocardial blush. So this is the second case, which can be called another failure of a clopidogrel to prevent the event. So clopidogrel, has been a miracle for us before 11 years ago because it was the best method for us to use in patients with acute coronary syndrome, no doubt. But when you look at it, the literature, Clarity and Comet, which showed that clopidogrel with aspirin really is, 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 is an advantage over using a single antiplatelet in those patients. You look at those, the Clarity was post therapy 50% of communication were post therapy. 
It was not dedicated. They were not dedicated type of data and trials for the primary PCI of semi patients, which we know today. So it was not. It was not. The limitations of ectopedical are well known to all of us. It's a slow onset and a slow offset, which, you know, the slow onset makes it kind of uh, not that wonderful to take patients to the cat lab within hours of giving it as a load. Slow offset, when you stop it, it takes five to seven days to train. There's a variable efficacy and largely related to variations in metabolism, and it does not really lead to an excellent inhibition of the P2Y12 inhibition. That's why 11 years ago, when the PLATO came out using Ticagulo, which showed beyond that, that Ticagulo is superior to Clopidigo in acute coronary syndrome patients in terms of outcome and mortality. I will focus in the coming 10 minutes I have or so on the subgroup of patients in the PLATO who had ST elevation myocardial infarction. I just want you to notice this, and I'm sure a lot of you know it, but it's important to, 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 to stress this point. That patients who were in, included in the PLATO study, clopidogrel use, like my two patients, was not an exclusion. While in the Triton trial, which used the Presugo, clopidogrel use was an exclusion. So that's an important thing to know. Now, the patients who in the PLATO had ST elevation myocardial infarction out of the 18,000 including in the, included in the trial were about 8,400 patients, 8,400 patients. They included patients uh, which have ST elevation, which is very obvious in the ECG with the planned primary PCI or new or presumed new lift bundle and the planned primary PCI. Those are patients which are about 8% of the 8,400 patients, or the patients were admitted without elevation, but the final diagnosis of STEMI was given to those patients. Look at the mean exclusion criteria of the PLATO. It's very important just for me to look at, for you to look at this here. Bradycardia, sinus bradycardia, or first degree AV block was not an exclusion. I mean, that's an, I think that's an important thing to remember. So it was not an exclusion. However, if you have first degree block or sinus bradycardia with symptoms of hemodynamic instability, of course, that's another situation. So what did the STEMI subgroup patients, the 8,400 out of the 18,000 showed? Well, consistent, consistent potency of ticagulol and superiority over clopidogrel with 15% reduction in the relative risk of the primary maze of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke consistent with the PLATO patients overall. And this showed beyond doubt, irrespective of whether there was ST elevation or a new lift bundle or a presumed ST elevation diagnosis afterwards. And look at this here. It didn't matter how much clopidogrel you gave. 300 after, uh, for those patients or 600, still ticagulol was better than clopidogrel in terms of outcome. And the hierarchy showed beyond doubt the most important part of the PLATO trial. All cause mortality was reduced 18% as a relative risk in the PLATO uh, trial, which is compared to, to Triton. You know that this, this, this was not shown either, neither in the ISO 5 uh, REACT study. So, what were the study medications and the procedures? Again, I wanted because I showed you patients with a clopidogrel failure. Open label clopidogrel pre-randomization in terms of percentage, none. So about 56% were actually naive. Some were already taking 75 milligram. And the loading before randomization was either 300 or 600, which whatever you use. But again, whatever that clopidogrel arm was, ticagrelol was superior. When you look at the co-medications, what, what catches the eye here, those, those are patients who are at high risk, some of, most of them, for atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. Only 20% of them were taking regular aspirin at the time when they presented. 
At that time, 11 years ago, look at the uh, generous use of GTP3A inhibition, 34%, 35% in both arms, which we don't use a lot these days as much as they used 11 years ago. Again, when we look at the STEMI subgroup, cardiovascular death and total myocardial infarction was reduced 19% with the cagular compared to clopidogrel. All cause mortality 18%. And stent thrombosis, which is an important item. It's, we, we know that with the improvement of stents, with the thin struts, we don't see it a lot. I agree, we don't see it a lot, but it's still there. It's still a problem. And when you encounter it, it's, it's, it's a huge burden on us interventionists and our patients. The calcular compared to clopidogrel, definite stent thrombosis what is used, was reduced 39%, the definite. 39%. And if you add probable to that, okay, you, you, you also get 31%. This is 39 and 31%. You know that uh, probable is next to definite in terms of uh, strength. Possible, I think the patient with doc, which our friend Dr. Samir showed is a possible uh, type of uh, very late stent thrombosis or late stent, stent thrombosis. We can talk about that in the discussion. So in the STEMI patients, the subgroup, the total major bleed did not differ compared to the other acute coronary syndrome, non-STEMI or unstable patients in Plato in terms of no major, no major bleed or transfusions or fatal bleeds in the decagular arm compared to the clopidogrel arm. This is an important uh, slide to look at. Why? Because decagular versus clopidogrel showed also safety in terms of bleeding and major bleed, whether you have ST elevation in, uh, or lift bundle at randomization. And you know, in the beta trial, even in the unstable and unstable patients, it, it was also shown the same thing. Now, age group, you know that uh, those age groups are a bit uh, an issue for the for the Pasugo. It did not matter. Weight did not matter, which matters for Pasugo. Like my patient who has 58 kilo, kilograms, and the previous TIA or any, any strokes, whether it's hemorrhagic or not, also it did not matter in terms of outcome and major bleed incidents, which is also another pressurgal issue when you, when you think about it. So STEMI subgroup has almost a copy-paste incidence of dyspnea, but you look at that, this continuation of therapy was really very little, very, very, very little. And the bradycardic events were there, but Again, none of them led to uh, hemodynamic instability. Pacemaker placement, you look at that compared to, 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 to clopidogrel, was almost the same of not be significant. So when the Plato came out 11 years ago, it told us that the number needed to treat to avoid one primary end point in terms of cardiac death, MI or stroke is 59. That's very good on top of good medical therapy. So the cardiac at the time was expected to become a new standard of care for the management of patients with STEMI intended for a prime intended for a primary PCI. That's very important. The difference in thrombosis for our patients on the cardiac compared to clopidogrel up to one year, thirty-three percent reduction. And when you look at the subgroup of patients, let me magnify this a little bit. It did not matter how much of a high dose of clopidogrel you gave. Still, ticagulol is better in terms of stent thrombosis in those patients. It really did not matter. And, and that's an important message for patients, for our colleagues who sometimes, for, sometimes for good reasons, they use a clopidogrel over ticagulol or the new resogrel. So, again, the benefit of ticagulol over clopidogrel across all ACS patients was obvious uh, whether you have. ST elevation with bundle or without, and you look at this, uh, this benefit is a tremendous 32% reduction of the event. Now, if we switch gear in, in the coming three, uh, I'm sorry, six minutes actually, which I have, uh, when you look at head to head comparison, not in random trials, but in the literature of uh, Ticagulo and Pasugal. I like both molecules and I think they are definitely superior to, to clopidogrel. And in my 
eyes, there is no good reason, in my, in, in my point of view, to use a clopidogrel anymore in acute coronary syndrome, unless you have a very good reason not to. But anyways, look at it. How about all the trials uh, of, uh, uh, of this slide here? The over, let me just remove my picture. From it. So the overall trial versus STEMI subset versus primary PCI subsets in patients in, 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 in Plato and Triton. What do, what do you see here? STEMIs and patients going to primary PCI. STEMIs going to primary PCI. There is no significant interaction between treatment effect and patient substance. They both work. And you can use any of them depending on the patient candidacy for, the, for this molecule. Um, now, that's the initial randomized study in 2016, which ran head to head ticagrelor versus Prasugil for primary PCI, was stopped for futility. It included very small patients, but, but even in those small patients, none of the molecules show superiority over the other. So if we lump Plato, Triton, Trilogy, which looked at the Prasugil in medically treated patients and elderly patients, and ISA Act 5, what do we find? The, between the four trials, I got this uh, as courtesy from Gabriel Steg actually, 45,000 patients included. The ISA Act actually has less than 10% of those included. 18,000 came from Plato, 13,000 from Triton. When you look at here, just coming down, primary PCI was the, the, the whole treatment module for Pasugal treated patients in Triton. Of course, why is that? Because there was no pretreatment with the Pasugal in a Triton trial, while there was pretreatment in the Plato trial with Ticagro. And when you look at the relative risk of bleeding, what do you find here? In the Plato, well, it's a bit neutral with the Clopidogrel, but once you start using Pasugal, the bleeding tendency seems to be a bit higher. And the relative risk of mortality which was beneficial in the Plato, was not shown as strongly in the others with the Pasugo and the ISA react actually, the, the, the hazard was 1.23. So according to Gabriel Streck, and that I took it from him actually, this is not my words, that's his words. The current non STEMI percentage of PCI in the US is about 60%. So ACS, as our colleagues showed, 60% of our presenters are actually non STEMIs. So what did he conclude? For patients undergoing PCI and or going to the lab right away and not previously treated with the clopidogrel, hey, Haketana is an important issue. In the Triton, those patients were excluded, like my two patients. But Sugil is an excellent choice, and I totally agree with the statement. However, for many health systems, with at least 40% of non STEMI ultimately are getting medical treatment only without PCI. With patients who, have to, who had prior strokes or underweight less than 60 or 75 years or above, and patients who require transfer from one hospital to others with delays to the cath lab, in his, in his words, Stig's words, ticagrelor remains the most attractive drug for those patients. So when would I use Pysurgo? It's definitely superior to clopidogrel. It's a once-a-day medicine with possibly greater efficacy amongst diabetics, as shown in the Triton study, study and the subgroup of patients with diabetes. Cons, restrictions related to age, above 75, body weight below 60, and any prior TIA or stroke. It's a cath lab drug only. Please remember that. It's not for cabbage or medically treated patients. While ticagrelor is superior to clopidogrel as well as Rasugo, its robust cardiovascular mortality reduction of 18% cannot be denied. It's effective for all ACS patients across the board, even for patients who are medically treated. There are no restrictions for age above 75 or body weight below 60 or prior TIA or strokes. Cones, it's a VID dosing. People can uh, say, well, the compliance issue and the dyspnea, which can happen. And I'm finishing with the last two slides now. So the antithrombotic treatment for STEMI patients undergoing PCI, that's, that's the golden wording, undergoing PCI. 
Aspirin, when a recommendation is recommended for all patients without contraindications at an initial loading dose of 150 to 300 or 75 to 250 IV, we used to have it in Jordan. I, I, I can hardly find it anymore. The IV, acetylic acid. And on a maintenance of 75 to 100 daily, long term, regardless of the treatment strategy. And one a recommendation, a potent P2Y12 inhibitor, like Pasugal or Ticagulo, or Clopidogrel, if these are not available or contraindicated as recommended before, or at least at the time of PCI, which is recommended more for Pasugal, and maintained over 12 months unless there are contraindications such as excessive risk of bleeding. Switching recommendations between oral P2Y12 inhibitors, I just chose this point to stress it out. In patients with ACS who were previously exposed to clopidogrel, switching from clopidogrel to ticagulum is recommended early as a class one with level of evidence B after hospitalization admission at a loading dose of 180, irrespective of the timing and loading dose of a clopidogrel, unless contraindicated to ticagulum uh, use is existing. What does that mean? If a patient comes on clopidogrel to the emergency with a STEMI, according to the data we have, he's not a basuchal candidate. And if a patient comes with a STEMI and your colleague in the emergency room loads him with clopidogrel 300 or even 600, what the, do the guidelines say? It's a class one, my colleagues, recommendation to give them ticagulum or loading dose and they proceed to take them to the cat lab. With that, from beautiful Jerusalem, where all religions are there, hopefully, inshallah, in the future. Thank you very much. And I, I think this was my last slide. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, I really enjoyed, uh, uh, I would say, our presentations. Uh, Dr. Assad uh, uh, concentrated uh, on uh, how to uh, diligently manage the risks of being at ischemic risk and how high it can be compared in the meantime with the bleeding risk, how high it can be and how uh, it, is, it, has, it needs a, a master of management to deal with the, with the uh, probabilities and expected outcomes from patients when we deal with them and evaluate their risks as it comes. And uh, for you, Dr. Hadi, you really diligently also explained to us the role of dual antiplatelets, how we differentiate between them in the process of managing our acute Crohn syndromes. Your cases were really representatives and uh, they were really well explained and I really enjoyed. I hope all the, our attendees have done that. My cases were more of a, the outcomes related to the uh, acute coronary syndromes being a high risk entity associated with multivessel disease as in my cases, and also with diabetes, particularly diabetes uh, and its contribution to the worsening of their condition and perhaps the diffuseness of the disease and the likelihood of mortality that is quite high. I hear open the uh, stage for questions. If we have questions from uh, our attendees, please go ahead and, uh, and uh, start your conversation. Uh, the, the, uh, I will have, a, if I can wait a little bit, but if you want me, if I do not hear any, Questions? Uh, allow me, allow me, Samir, allow me. Uh, doctor, there's Dr. Hassan Garbari mm -hmm. uh, posted a question. Okay. What I, guy? I, I don't see it myself. This is why. Uh, I see it. I see it on my screen. So that's why I wanted okay. to share it with you. Okay. He said, "What what guide you used oh, in yes, RCA of the second case?" Okay. I think that was for Dr. Malouf, I guess, right? The RCA for your second case, uh, Assad? Assad, I think. Right. Yeah. Judkins Wright. It was Judkins, Judkins Wright? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
And yeah, we know uh, that the uh, amplets uh, left was more dangerous for dissection in uh, these cases, but Judkin's right uh, is, is okay. Sure. But it can still happen, even with Judkin's of course, right. Of I course. just had it uh, two weeks ago when I basically uh, injected into the right, and the lesion was not very close to the tip of the catheter. And immediately, immediately, uh, with a with a with a lightning uh, effect, it uh, caused uh, Timmy flow uh, zero to one, and uh, without a wire and without a guider, it was a diagnostic catheter. So you can imagine uh, how how you can deal with it. And unfortunately, uh, I managed to put the guider, and then first wire went subintimal, then a second wire with a with a with a U curve. I managed to go into the lumen and stand. The uh, actually, you know, for for you know the way we were taught in our fellowship, actually, and I still do that diligently. Every time I engage the ostium of the left mean or the right, I make sure that I keep looking at the blood pressure. Uh, I still diligently do it, and I hope I will not stop doing that later, because you know th that that really gives you a lot of ideas. Sometimes, not every time, and I'm sure Assad was doing it anyways, but. Just for the, our young fellows to look, you know, look at the blood pressure. Every time you engage, keep looking at the blood pressure in front of you. Damping your yeah. blood pressure might tell you that there's something yeah. wrong. Right. And forceful injection against against the wall of the left main or the roof of the of the, roof the, of the right of the corner. Main. Yeah, might be. Yeah, might be the the the, the first uh, yeah. thing which can happen in terms of disasters. You but see, in my little... case, it could have been the wire that dissected, not necessarily the... Uh, sure. the of course. The sure. So we have sure. these two options there uh, present. Mm -hmm. and. Uh... But nowadays, uh, the ability of our wires that are much safer than the older days, I'm talking about me, the older guy, uh, it's happening less and less. Um, if I recall, my recent dissections are mostly... Uh, uh, either caused by a guider that went into the roof of the left main and dissected it, or it went into the proximal lesion of the RCA and dissected it. As I showed, I have you, a Go ahead. As I showed you, the statistics for guide catheter dissections have have decreased uh, uh, tremendously, tremendously. Over, the past, uh, over the past few years, and the statistics right. uh, are coming from uh, from Japan. <clears throat> Over the yeah, past even, few years, it, it dropped by, by one third. Exactly. The actually judicious use of guiding catheters that are less traumatic and less aggressive towards the ostium of either the left or the right is also critically important. Let me ask you, Samir, your patient, which unfortunately succumbed to sudden cardiac death, how many months after the latest procedure? It, it was uh, about 10 months. 10 months. So yeah, by the, the, the by period of time that was uh, he did the, after three months I did not see him, but sure. after the three months I saw him three times, and each time he told me I'm living a new life. He he really said it this way. You can sure. tell why the LAD the only vessel he was living on was distally diseased. Sure. The uh, cerc was totally occluded, not even a single collateral. And the right was totally occluded, again, not even a single collateral. So opening these vessels, even if the air, and don't forget that his LV was reasonably normal. I mean, it went down to 45% after the initial encounter, but reasonably normal. That means it's a viable territory. I didn't even have to do a nuclear in him because each time he came, he had a, a, some sort of an semi at the time. And, and I, be, I believe he benefited. So why did he die suddenly? This guy uh, had cabbage, he had multiple uh, stents to the vein grafts, the, he, uh, all of them failed. Uh, we opened two totally occluded vessels. Now what could have happened? Yes, they could have rebuilt. He is a kind of a, of a, a, a black builder, no doubt about it. Uh, because, and young, you're talking about, he was, he was 41 or 42 years old when he had his cabbage. For the sake, for, for the sake of argument, I think it's a beautiful case which you presented, Samir. But for the sake of argument, he falls into, by the arc definition, 
southern Kadek that 10 months down the line, both cabbage, both multiple stents, it's a possible stent thrombosis. It's not, definitely it's not definite. It's not the probable, but it's possible. You and I know yeah, that's a possible. Uh, it's this one is of the uh, possibilities. Sure. Although surely. I've seen people uh, dying without stent thrombosis. Sure, oh, surely, surely. Yeah, could, uh, Lena, I mean, uh, really unexplained death. Uh, sure. We had one patient who came into the ER three days after an MI uh, in a cardiac arrest. And we took him, uh, he was done by me three days before acute, after acute MI. And I opened his LAD with a large stent. And I took him immediately while CPRing him to the cath lab and I checked his arteries and all three vessels were patent, including the LAD that I, uh, that we uh, actually, uh, uh, we kept on CPR and he recovered initially, but it was a late recovery. Then he developed some sort of a, a, of a straight line and a not pulseless electrical activity some 12 hours later and died. Sure, sure. So sure. that is, uh, is part of the syndrome. There's one question because I want to answer other questions. Dr. Mohammed Mamoun asked, now we are seeing new evidence about the use of antiplatelet monotherapy in high bleeding risk. I think the, uh, you quoted the, uh, the uh, Dr. Asad, the, the, the uh, Twilight and the other studies and also the study on, uh, on uh, Zions uh, about the use of uh, single uh, uh, antiplatelet, which could be the case at, as long as we be, build uh, the uh, so-called uh, the risk element uh, contributing to either bleeding or, or, or ischemia. What do you think, Asad, uh, in response to this question? Well, I, I think it's all, it's all about patient selection. If you look at the extreme of your patient that you just discussed now, the multivessel, diffuse disease, diabetic patient, and you say, well, this patient died 10 months later, this patient is going to die anyway. I mean, he's a very high-risk patient. Of having <laughs> He's going to die. And I have many patients like yours who we try as much as possible to maintain their coronary arteries. But at some point after so many stents, one of them is going to occlude. So this is the extreme case of thrombosis. Now you yeah. have the extreme case of bleeding. If someone has a very high bleeding risk, okay. how yeah. can you optimize okay, your management? It really depends on, first of all, the balance between the ischemic risk and the bleeding risk. In other words, if you had your patient, Samia, who had a bleeding, then this would be a catastrophe because you're stuck between two walls. You're right. You cannot manage anymore. But if you have a patient with a simple lesion, low risk for thrombosis, okay, with a high bleeding risk, that's a good scenario. The bad scenario is when you have these two risks are very high. High, risk, high thrombotic risk. Well, here, the way you manage with the evidence that we have from the literature is that we have to give the best dual antiplatelet for the minimum time necessary. And so far with a very high bleeding risk, we can go one month, but mind you, we have to make a lot of calculations there. In other yeah. words, if you want to stop, if you want to stop at one month, you have to optimize your, your, your management in the cath lab. You have to use the best stance, and the evidence is with the- with And I was guided, I was guided. Absolutely. I was okay. guided or OCT guided. I was both have, the, have evidence for that. That's so right. once you have this in, in mind, once you have the luggage, of uh, the luxury of having a good result with the PCI you do, even in non-ST elevation, and the studies showed that about one third to 40% of these studies looked at the non-ST elevation, including in their cases. But in these cases also, you can still manage with a short duration of your antiplatelet. Now, the next question is, what would you give after this short duration, be it one month or three months? Would you give clopidogrel? Would you give Brillinta? Would you give, which medication would you give? Now, in, in Japan, they use a lot of clopidogrel. 
and they used it in their uh, recent study to preside that. Mind you, in these cases, you have, you have to, to, to check for the resistance to the clopidogrel. The 2018 uh, guidelines tells you that you have to check for that. The 2020 guidelines, they give you the luxury to check for some the resistance to the clopidogrel or not. They will tell you, well, it's your call. Maybe you don't have it in your country, maybe you do, but nevertheless, it is your call. So now the, the, we have to look into, into this, which one is better? Is it gonna be Brillenta or is it gonna be Clopidogrel for the treatment, for the single antiplatelet treatment after this dual antiplatelet treatment? So there is a lot, of, a lot of balance, a lot of calculations to be done uh, we need scoring systems that are efficient scoring system comparing for the bleeding and for the ischemic. But uh, <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, you have to manage the case before you go into it. Thank so you. Can I, can I, so we are running yeah. short on time. Yeah. I need, we have so many questions to answer. Yeah. There was one question to you, Asad, about uh, okay. the severe mitral regurgitation of your case, whether you had to use a, uh, a mechanical support or not. Yes. Uh, just in, in two words. In two Three words. words. <laughs> in two words, I, I was I was quick enough not to use the mechanical support. If you, you are could quick, have. and the patient is in the cath lab. Okay. And I was quick enough to, to give them Lasix before I entered the uh, the PCI. So okay. the patient uh, the patient improved remarkably. Dr. Abdullah Qasas asked a question to Dr. Hadi. Do you think that ticagrelor induced dyspnea in Mediterranean uh, patients more commonly than others? Uh, this it observation looks like, is Jordan. What yeah, it looks about? like I don't know what you see, Samih in Saudi, and what uh, Assad sees in Lebanon. Our colleagues here in Jordan, I hear it from them very commonly that uh, the 11 uh, percent, 12 percent Disney are reported in Plato, actually with that they are encountering more than that. And the less than 1 percent discontinuation of Ticagulo that they are actually discontinuing the medicine more than that. Oh, but okay. as Dr. Kassasso mentioned, I mean, we didn't have MENA patients to judge on. Uh, so it's really a hard question to answer, but maybe, maybe we have it more. I don't know. Yeah, I have I have a comment here. That I would say I would say uh, we have more of a scare tactics in our uh, uh, medical milieu, uh, in that we 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 tend to exaggerate, or the patients may tend to exaggerate. To my uh, experience, I have not seen enough of it, and I think it's very really low. Uh, because of time, let me go to the next question from Dr. Yusuf Najm, an old friend. In case of multi stents uh, and low bleeding risk patients, would you consider lifelong DAPT? And if not, why? Now, this fits to my patients uh, because uh, my patients had multiple stentings, uh, and also uh, the cases, uh, one of the cases of Dr. Assad. I would say yes. I, this is what I do in some of these patients. I do not stop dual antiplatelets. The question is, do we uh, expand uh, Ticagrelor or Brillenta up to 36 months in a routine way uh, as uh, per Pegasus? But unfortunately, we don't have 60 milligram uh, dose yet available in our market, but I will be it's worthwhile considering. Yes, there is a little bit of extra bleeding, but the benefit outweighs the risk. And um, Dr. Hadi, excellent lecture. I want to ask, this is from Saleh Sbeitan. I want to ask if stent occluded after one year, it considered corpidogrel failure? That's a very good question. I, th I think what, what we forget sometimes, we don't give a dual antiplasis to prevent stent thrombosis. It's not only stent thrombosis which we're looking for. At this day of age, stent thrombosis is so little. It's so little. You and I and our colleagues hearing us now, we don't encounter it so often. When we give it to an antiplasis, we look for future ischemic events. I mean, that's the bottom line. When you give dual antiplatelets, you expect ischemic events in those patients to be less than the ones who are not on dual antiplatelets. So the way I see it, Saleh, if a patient is taking clopidogrel, 
and he is maintaining good medical therapy otherwise and good lifestyle otherwise. And they fail to do that and they come back with ischemic burden, clots, more ischemic uh, vessels, um, et cetera. It definitely the medicine is not working as good as we want it to be. So that's, that's why I would call them in a way clobidibial failure in those, in those patients. Excellent. Uh, Abdullah again asked uh, another question. He said, uh, second quarter to Dr. Hadi, you did LCX, uh, I think you means case. You did LCX oh, oh. OM bifurcation, stenting, yes. with final kissing, but without, uh, I had this from me, without a pot, is provisional one stent strategy. Is reasonable? Is it a I, I pragmatic think, approach for you? What do you, what do you think? I think that's a very, a, a very reasonable question to ask. The patient had acute STEMI. It, it looks like it was a one, one, one type of uh, bifurcation medina lesion, but you always can postulate that the obtuse marginal is mainly spasm from the spastic milieu, and you can do a provisional and do accordingly whether you want to do a stent for the obtuse marginal accordingly. But probably you are obligated, uh, Dr. Abdullah, to open the osteal obtuse margin. You cannot just leave it like that. So you can just balloon it uh, and see what happens without dedicating yourself to two-stent strategy. So you don't, I agree with you, you could have done it without dedication to two-stent strategy at six in the morning in a STEMI patient. Yeah, but here in, in your case, uh, the equality or near equality of the vessels in size and the jeopardy uh, expected to be if you uh, manage to do only one stent provisionally and then uh, you underestimate how limited the flow. You, as you know, now there's the recommendation you can use FFR for the branch before you conclude it. Uh, I would say, uh, you know, there are certain conditions, including the angles, the size of the vessels, the targeted area at risk, all of this can ju uh, judge or plan, put you in a, in a position to put the, the right strategy at the right time. Um, now, maybe you don't can have I any ask, questions. Can I ask Asad a quick question? Because I mentioned it in my lecture. I noticed that you use Lovinox a lot in the emergency room. Oh, yes, oh, the emergency room. These are the emergency room physicians. We keep on telling them <laughs> not to use them. But These, it's in uh, the guidelines. They use Clopidogrel also. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it I is in the guidelines, so they are not uh, against the guideline. But I, no, agree. It's not. I mean, well, they're lower category, of course. And <laughs> And no, so no. What, do you, what do you do, Asad, in terms of uh, anticoagulation management in the cat lab for a STEMI who got Lovinox in the emergency room? Lovinox, for our colleagues here in Jordan, it's the same as the Clixan in our well, 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 the, the it's, it's, um, you cannot switch. Exactly. You cannot yeah, switch. but you don't, that's, you, you, that's you, no, no. you cannot yeah. switch. Once so the timing is important. Lovinox, you continue with the Lovinox. Yeah. So uh, you're stuck with it. So, and there is a protocol about how to use uh, additional dose if you if you cross beyond the, uh, the eight hours. The eight, it's the eight hour, yeah, yeah. And the eight then hour. you can, otherwise you don't have to. So may, maybe uh, towards the end, uh, I would say we still have about uh, seven minutes. Each one of us will uh, have a chance to comment uh, two, two, two and a half minutes, let's say. Uh, so uh, I'll start with Dr. Asad. Uh, Asad, what do you think? Uh, how uh, how did we approach acute Cohen syndromes, and uh, how do we evaluate our uh, presentations? And how much of an education do you think we can offer more? Well, I think these uh, these lectures are very important. They can open uh, the uh, the discussion. Uh, with the with the cases, we can improve them by uh, by questions. Uh, sometimes uh, questions and answers. This can elicit more of uh, a sense of uh, um, of understanding more of the of the cases and of of uh, of the management of our case. So questions and answers are very important. Um, uh, 
what we're doing, I think everyone is doing interesting cases, interesting cases with management of cases are also very important ways of dealing uh, with these active cases. So once you see some, some, uh, uh, some action in the case, your kind of your brain starts functioning more. Well, in this situation, I can manage it this way or that way. So when you have a case and this case is applicable to uh, the strategy we use in the, in the uh, literature, then it you understand it more, you learn more. So I think uh, interactivity also is very important. So once you have this interactive uh, between uh, you and your colleagues with the questions between you and the case with, uh, with the advent of, of science, then I think we will learn more uh, about, about uh, no doubt. interesting and, and uh, uh, important, uh, important at the edge. You see, when I, when I discussed the three months and six months and nine months, you're going to see a lot of improvement now. As you could see, the ESC guideline uh, checked it every, every few years. Now, now you can see every two years, you're going to see some new guidelines, maybe later every one year because of, yes. the, of, the, of, the, of the bulk of, of studies that are coming up. So no uh, I think uh, this will tell us that we need to do these conferences more frequently to update ourselves. No doubt. Uh, Hadi, what do you think? Uh, any I other think ideas? I, 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 I tremendously enjoyed our evening tonight, Hayan. I, I learned a lot from you guys, for sure, and from our colleagues who raised the questions, too. I think in, in, the two, in the two minutes time you allocated to me, I, I, what would I say? I would say that uh, there are certain things we have to remember. Aspirin as a molecule uh, in post-PCI came out without, as an indication, without any randomized trials. I mean, everybody knows that the first one who did this was Dr. Granzig himself after the angioplasty he did, and went on after that as a routine measure. You, you do, and any time you, you, you touch the vessel with a balloon or a stent, what have you, then you have to have an aspirin on board. So we don't have randomized trials, actually, to look at patients without aspirin until the worst trial came out from Germany, which dropped the aspirin early on. So this is, this is one. Uh, and with that, what, what Dr. Assad pointed out, I think, by twilight, uh, and you look at the, the, the data which we have, I think the escalation of dual antiplatelets, anti in my opinion, is not a favorable approach. I think what's more important uh, is like what, what was really elegantly put to tonight, you look at the ischemic versus the bleeding burden on those patients. And I see that, I mean, if you put an OM stent in a patient, who came in with lateral myocardial infarction. Why in the world, other than the ACS indication for 12 months, we know that it has to go for 12 months until now, but let's assume that this patient has some kind of bleeding issues, bleeding with the ulcers, et cetera. So why even get stuck in your mind not to drop the aspirin and keep the ficagol well, if you gave it at three months and so forth. So I think we have to, in a way to come out of our fear. Uh, we have a fear, we do, interventional cardiologists. Oh, dropping the aspirin, something might happen, stent thrombosis, etc. And we, I want to overstress the point that the stent thrombosis is still there. We don't like to see it, but it's becoming a rare incident. And I, I really truly believe that the best way to prevent stent thrombosis is to perfect your job when you do it. It's not the dual antiplatelet alone. Perfect, thank you. Thank and you, you prevent it. Yeah. So, thank you very much thank for hosting you. me, Samir. Uh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. I will. I will uh, conclude with the, uh, the education that I got myself. First, I, I really enjoyed your cases and uh, the way they were managed. Uh, and to, uh, towards ACS management. I, I learned from my first case something that I think is, I'd like to tell people about is that. Uh, when we uh, caught a patient that he is a heart failure patient and we ignore the underlying uh, cause, particularly when it comes to 40% uh, of them having underlying ischemic heart disease undiagnosed, we really fail to treat our patients. And we really have to rigorously 
look into the possibility of underlying ischemic heart disease. The, the fact that they may improve dramatically after re resolving their underlying ischemic heart disease and improve their outcome. And I think this is one of the things. I really enjoyed uh, this uh, uh, seminar, uh, uh, webinar, sorry, we should call it. And uh, uh, thank you for your contribution. I thank all uh, the attendees and their questions. Uh, I thank our host uh, and uh, uh, Susanica for uh, arranging for this meeting. And thank you all. Uh, I think we are ready to leave. Uh, goodbye, take care, Be, stay safe. Uh, we don't need Corona to affect our life. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome.